Welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the faculty lecture series. My name is Kasia Piepczak, Professor of French and Comparative Literature and Chair of Arabic Studies. I have the pleasure of serving on this year's lecture committee and co-organizing this series with Steve Fine and Joel Lee. Today's lecture by Li Yu is the fourth of our six lecture series. You may now access the previous three lectures by Jeremy Cohn, Nicholas Howe, and Nelly Rosario online. And we hope to see you in person or via Zoom for the final two lectures of our 2022 series by our colleagues, Tim Lebeski and Lama Nasser. Today, it is my great pleasure to introduce Li Yu, Professor of Chinese and inaugural chair of the Department of Asian Languages, Literatures and Cultures. Li is a remarkable language pedagogue and cultural historian. She holds a BA in teaching Chinese as a foreign language from East China Normal University and an MA and PhD in Chinese language pedagogy and cultural history from the Ohio State University. Since her arrival at Williams in 2005, Li has helped hundreds of students achieve proficiency in Chinese and function successfully in Chinese culture. In recognition of her pedagogical talent in the classroom and her work training teachers of Chinese, she has served as director of Chinese at the Alex Summer Teacher Training Institute at Washington University in St. Louis, as well as serving as visiting faculty and teacher trainer at the training program for teachers of Chinese at the Ohio State University. She also manages a resource website for the Performed Culture Approach, an innovative teaching framework developed in the field of East Asian language pedagogy. Li has published almost two dozen book chapters and peer-reviewed articles. Her most recent publication is a 2021 edited volume titled New Trends in Teaching Chinese as a Foreign Language. In addition to her scholarship on Chinese language pedagogy, Li also conducts research on the history of reading and reading pedagogy in late imperial China. Her talk today, How to Teach a Child to Read, Lessons from Chinese Cultural History, will bridge these two scholarly fields, showing us how teaching techniques from the 17th to 19th century have influenced how Chinese can be taught today as a second language. After her talk, we'll open the floor to Q&A. You may type in your uh, questions in the Q&A um, or in the chat. I believe that's op also open and uh, Lee will respond to them directly. So um, that's it from me. Um, if you would, uh, please join me in welcoming Li Yu. Thank you, Kasia, for the nice introduction. Um, I would also like to thank the lecture committee for inviting me to give this talk. Um, it's a huge honor to be here uh, sharing my research with everybody. Um, I would also like to thank Carrie Pierce and Steve Amman for doing a lot of the behind the scenes work. Thank you. Um, so the title of my talk is How to Teach a Child to Read. Uh, I'm sure many caregivers, um, parents or grandparents who are in the audience today really enjoy reading to a child or grandchild. So at the end of my talk today, I'm going to share with you a very simple technique uh, which can help a young child learn to read faster. So although this technique is based on the lessons learned from Chinese cultural history, it can also be applied to any language. And if you're a language learner, it could be any language, it doesn't have to be Chinese. I also hope that my talk can give you some good ideas as to how to accelerate your study in a new language. So I, I would like to start my talk by acknowledging that Williams College stands on the ancestral homelands of the Stockbridge Monsi Mohicans, who are the indig indigenous peoples of the region now called Williamstown. Following tremendous hardship after being forced from their valued homelands, they continued as a sovereign tribal nation in Wisconsin, which is where they reside today. The Mohicans used to speak the Mohican language, which has gone extinct for several decades now. 
Language is an important marker for one's identity and a powerful tool for communication and community building. A new language also opens a new world to us and trains our mind to think in a different way. Language exists because human beings rely on collaborative work and communication. Languages die for various reasons. Some languages have disappeared because they cannot compete with the dominant language that comes with power. So during the imperial China, the dominant language of power was what we today call classical Chinese or Wen Yan. Classical Chinese was not a spoken language. It was a written language which had helped the Chinese empire manage its bureaucratic infrastructure through paper and brush. In different parts of China, people all spoke a local vernacular. Learning to read in classical Chinese was like learning a second language written in a complex writing system. In order to climb the social ladder in this huge empire and to bring glory and honor to their families, children, often sons, needed to learn to read in this written language and then succeed in the civil service examination. So the stakes were really high and the chances were really slim. How did children learn to read in those times? The key question I set out to ask is how children learn to read in Imperial China. I'm interested in this topic mainly because of two reasons. First, the history of reading is an intriguing research area. And if you want to know how people read and what people read in a given society, you also need to ask the question of what, uh, how children in that society are taught to read. The second reason is that I'm a professional language teacher and Chinese reading is known to be very challenging for second language learners. China has a very long written history recorded by its unique writing system. I wanted to know if our ancestors and predecessors in the teaching field had come up with any good teaching method that can inspire today's Chinese language teaching. For today's talk, I will share with you some major findings based on my research. First, prior to the late 17th century, there was this prevalent emphasis on memorization and vocalization. At the same time, a lot of pedagogical emphasis was placed on helping children learn how to punctuate text and explain text. Second, starting from the late 17th century, there was this turn to character recognition. And that change was due to the rise of paleography. Um, paleography is the study of ancient writing system. And between the late 17th century and mid 18th century, with the rise of evidential scholarship or xue, many teachers and scholars began to promulgate a new method of learning to read, which placed a lot of emphasis on character recognition. During the 19th and 20th century, the character recognition method influenced how Chinese were taught in elementary schools and how foreigners were taught to learn Chinese. So now let's look at a photo together. This photo uh, was taken by a man called Arthur Smith. Smith was a missionary to China in the 19th century. He lived in China for more than 50 years and wrote several books introduce, introducing China to the Western world. One of his most famous books was called Chinese Characteristics, in which he inc included many photos. This photo is captioned a Chinese boys school. So right now I would like to ask everybody to take a closer look at this photo um, and guess what is happening in this scene. So I'm going to launch a poll on screen and if you could um, take a few seconds to answer the poll, that would be great. Um, so I'm, I think I already launched it. Yeah. Um, can people see the poll? So what are these boys who are standing up in class doing? Um, are they performing a skit for the class? Are they reciting that day's lesson? Or are they being physically punished by the teacher? Okay, uh, let me launch it again. Okay, so good. So if you choose uh, the answer B, you are correct. Um, 
that these boys are actually reciting their lesson in front of the teacher. Um, so actually, uh, when Arthur Smith uh, shared this photo, he also provided a detailed description of what is uh, what happened um, on this photo. So here is what he wrote. All scholars in Chinese schools spend their time in shouting out their lessons at the top of their voices to the great injury of their vocal organs and to the almost complete distraction of the foreigner. This is old time custom. But if the inquiry for the reason be relentlessly pushed, one is told that without this audible assurance, the teacher would suspect that his pupils were not devoting their exclusive attention to their lessons. The singular practice of making each scholar turn their back upon the teacher during the recitation is likewise due to the desire of the teacher to be certain that the pupil is not furtively glancing at the book held in the master's hand. So he made several important observations here. Um, first is that these lessons need, needed to be shout out loud or read aloud by the students. And he also noticed, noted that this is an old time custom. And the interesting thing is that these students are turning that back toward the teacher. And interestingly, if you know Chinese, um, the word for reciting from memory is bei. Um, and this character or this word is exactly the same to describe the back of a, a, a person. Um, so basically, literally, to recite a book or recite a book from memory means literally to turn your back toward a book or to your teacher. So Arthur Smith is absolutely correct when he said that this custom has a long history. More than 100 years before Smith came to, uh, went to China, another foreign visitor from Korea also left some precious records for us to get a peek into the usual routine in a village school in northern China. Hong Tae Yong was a talented Korean scholar well versed in the Chinese classics. His uncle, Hong O, oh, served as the secretary of the of Korean uh, Sustitial Embassy of 1765 to 1766. As a relative, Hong Tae Yong joined the embassy nominally as his uncle's military aide. But in fact, he was a tourist, curious about everything from Chinese musical instruments to the edu educational system. So Hong kept a diary as he traveled and compiled a consolidated memoir after he returned to Korea. In this memoir, Hong related in great details what he saw at a village school in Northern China in the year of 1766. What he has observed echoed with Arthur Smith's observations and provided even greater details. So here's what he wrote. The teacher had just sat down in a chair under the north wall. There was a desk in front of him. The children took their turns to recite texts. The person who was going to recite present the book in both hands to the teacher, put it on the desk, stepped back and made a solemn bow, turned his back to the teacher, and recite it quickly. After reciting, he turned back and bowed solemnly. The teacher then stuck a red label on the chapter he had just recited and wrote the date on it. The child then stepped back and stood there. The ones following him all did it in the same manner. Those who had stepped back or looked down while standing straight. There was not one person who dared to look around or disturb the order. So as you can see, Hong provided much um, detailed uh, description of, of what children needed to do in their daily reading lesson. So what um, Arthur Smith and Hong Tae Yong had observed as cultural outsiders provided us with an ethnogra ethnographic description of what children did when they learned to read. If we examine the writings of Chinese educators and philosophers, we could find out why memorization and recitation was deemed so important in Chinese culture. Here's what Zhu Xi had to say on this topic. Zhu Xi was the founding father of Neo-Confucianism, a school of thought that fundamentally shaped the political culture and also philosophy of China from the 9th century onward. 
Zhu Xi was also a greatly respected educator during the 12th century. Here's what Zhu Xi prescribes. The value of a book is in the recitation of it. By, re by reciting it often, we naturally come to understand it. Now, even if we ponder over what's written on the paper, it's useless. For in the end, it isn't really ours. There's value only in recitation. Though I don't know how the mind so naturally becomes harmonious with the psychological stuff, feels uplifted and energized, and remembers securely what it reads, even supposing we were to read through a text thoroughly, pondering it over and over in our minds, it wouldn't be as good as reciting it. If we recite it again and again, in no time, the incomprehensible becomes comprehensible, and the already comprehensible becomes even more meaningful. So for Zhu Xi, recitation would help with comprehension. If you ask a cognitive scientist today, they will probably agree with Zhu Xi, because phonological loop has been found to be extremely important in the reading process, especially in the process of comprehension. So Zhu Xi advocated for the principle of the three presences, san dao. Reading is to take the words of the sages and worthies and pass them before your eyes and roll them around and around in your mouth and finally turn them over and over in your mind. In other words, to become a su successful reader, you need to connect the sound, graph or shape and meaning of each word. You need the presence of your eyes, your mouth and your mind at the same time. So in addition to vocalization and memorization, young children of the imperial period also needed to spend an enormous amount of time learning to punctuate and mark texts. During the late imperial period, books were usually published without any punctuation or markings. Although some primary texts meant for young learners was punctuated or marked, it was not the writer's job to add punctuation when they wrote. A teacher or a publisher might hire a scholar to punctuate a text. In other words, punctuating was part of the reader's responsibility, not the writer's. Therefore, learning to punctuate was an integral part of the process of learning to read. Here is an example from, uh, of a test paper in the civil service examination. So during the civil service examination, a student will usually uh, write their examination, examination essays in black ink. And then a clerk would copy uh, the finished essay in red ink before the paper was presented to the examiner. This procedure was done to prevent the examiner from telling the identity of the examinees through their calligraphy or other markings on paper. Then, so when the examiner received this red ink paper, they would grade the paper. So as you can see, um, this picture here, you can see actually the punctuation and markings um, made by the examiner. So this is really the reader's job um, to punctuate. This is part of the reading process. And another very important pedagogical procedure was to have students explain the texts that they have read. Teachers would have the children memorize and recite a text first before explaining the meaning of any text. After a while, they will quiz the children and ask them to explain back to them the meaning of those texts. In a 13th century daily schedule of study in a family school, a scholar named Cheng Duanli laid out in great, detail, great details how this procedure of text explication should be conducted. He wrote, first, let the students explain the elementary books then the great learning, then the analects. So these are all the basic books and basic classics in our Chinese education. If elementary books are explained, ask them to clarify Master Zhu's annotations and Mr. Xiong's explanatory notes and his section titles first. When this is done successfully, ask them to explain according to the accompanying notes on characters and sentences. For characters, look for their pronunciation. If it is not in the annotations, let them inspect rhyme books to find it. 
fabrication of character pronunciation should not be allowed to mislead people. A rough explanation according to the common understanding, however, is rather fine. When this is done successfully, ask them to explain the meanings of each sentence. When this is done, explain the meanings of every paragraph. Ask them to repeat, explaining the text to themselves. Challenge them with questions so that they can understand thoroughly. So, this is a very de detailed um, prescription, right? About how to what to do uh, in order in order to explain the text. So, if you were a student uh, in this family school, would you follow these guidelines? Probably not. Um, I always write very detailed guidelines for my students, and I think every time maybe only a very few students will will follow. Um, so what is described here, or what is prescribed here, um, is a procedure in an ideal world. In the real world, many students were probably rather sloppy. Some teachers were probably lazy or busy with their own business, and they simply asked students to recite without explaining the text to the students. So by the, in the late 17th century, a few teachers and fathers realized the problem of the traditional way of learning to read. One father, Tang Biao, published a book in 1699 titled Fine Teaching Methods for Fathers and Teachers, Fu Shi Shan Yu Fa, which contained important tips and rationale on how to select a good teacher, how to encourage children to learn, and how to teach young children basic reading and writing skills. At the beginning of this book, he related a story of his own son. His son, Zheng Xin, was 10 years old, but he couldn't recite a single text from memory. The family had to relocate because of, because of a rebellion in the region. When they sought shelter in the mountains, Tang, Tang Biao encountered a teacher, Zhu, who successfully taught Zheng Xin. Within months of enrolling in teacher Zhu's school, Zheng Xin was able to memorize and recite texts. Tang Biao was very surprised and asked the teacher Zhu his secret. Teacher Zhu explained that he did nothing but making sure that children know each and every character in the text they were going to recite and memorize. Tang Biao concluded that the key to successful reading was character recognition. He suggested that character blocks be made for young children each block would contain one character. Children should learn characters in isolation before learning to read. This method would bring the visual aspect of reading into the curriculum and turn children's attention to the shape, internal structure, and components of each and every character. After Tang Biao discovered and promoted this method, Wang Ying, a philologist, further refined Tang Biao's method. Wang Ying was an erudite scholar of the 18th century. He was an important figure in the School of Evidential Scholarship, or Kao Zhengxue. Evidential scholarship was an approach to study and research using textual criticism and empirical methods to study ancient classics. Wang Ying wrote an influential book titled Illustrated Examples for Shuo Wen Jie Zi. Shuo Wen Jie Zi or the analysis of characters through an explanation of graphs was a treatise on Chinese characters dated back to the second century. In his book, Wang Ying analyzed over 9,000 characters that appeared in the original Shuo Wen Jie Zi. Wang Ying was not just a productive scholar. He was also an excellent teacher for children. He chose 2,050 characters and wrote a different book, particularly for young children. This book is titled Character Learning for Young Children, Wen Zi Meng Qiu. He came up with some interesting explanations for these 2,000 characters so that children can remember them better and learn faster. Here's a page taken from that book. So here he introduces some basic characters such as the sun, the moon, cloud, rain, um, etc. Under each character, he presents their small seal form. 
because he believed that the small seal style or xiao zhuan of each character includes important clues as to the original meanings of these basic characters. He then used some very interesting language to describe each character. For example, for this character, Sam, he said, Here's the translation. There is a black shadow in the middle of the sun. So he's referring to the shape of this um, character. There's a shadow, there's a, a kind of line or dot in between. So this is a, this, there's a black shadow in the middle of the sun. At the beginning, the shape of this shadow was not fixed. This is what called the three feet crow, according to old legends. So the three feet crow is a mythical bird that was believed to reside in the sun, according to Chinese myth. And for the character for Moon, he offers another very interesting explanation. So this is the character for uh, Moon. Uh, he says, 月圆时少, 缺时多, 且让日, 故作上下闲时行也。中一笔本是地影。此早家所谓故兔贵树也。Here's the translation. The moon wanes more often than it is full. It also concedes to the sun. Therefore, the shape of this character imitates the moon when it wanes. The stroke in the middle is originally the shadow of the earth. But literary scholars say that this is the rabbit and osmanthus tree. The reference to the rabbit and osmanthus tree is connected with another Chinese myth, which says that in the moon, there's a moon palace, and then in there, uh, the lady uh, called Chang'e uh, resides there together with her jade rabbit. There was also this man called Wu Gang, who was banished there. He would cut um, an osmanthus tree repeatedly, only to find it regrow again and again. As you can see, what Wang Ming is trying to do here is to create a new pedagogical method that would cater to the needs of very young children with wild you know, imagination who would be eager to hear these interesting stories from their teachers or parents. In the original Shou Wen Jie Zi, the second century treatise on Chinese characters, the author Xu Shen identified six main character categories of Chinese characters. They are xiang xing zi, pictographs, zhi shi zi, ideographs, hui yi zi, ideographic compound, xing sheng zi, phonetic compounds, zhuan zhu, reversed and annotated, and jia jie zi, loans. The meaning and definition of the latter two categories is still controversial. Scholars can't really agree what they actually mean. Um, and some argue that these two categories actually refer to the usage of Chinese characters, but not their formation. Um, and also not many characters fall into these latter two categories. But the first four categories are said to be the main principles behind the creation and formation of Chinese characters. So to give you some example, um, so here, for example, pictographs, uh, here, there are some characters for the sun, the moon, mountain, and tree. So you can see they actually imitate the shape of these things um, in the, from the nature, uh, natural world. And for ideo ideographs, for example, here, this is the word for shang, up. So you have a horizontal line, and then um, uh, it points to the area above it. So this kind of indicates the idea of up. And then the character for xia, there's a horizontal line again, and it, the dots and the uh, vertical line points to the area that's beneath the horizontal line. So this indicates the idea of down. And similarly, the character for one is just this one horizontal line, one stroke, and number two is two horizontal line. Um, and the third category, uh, ideographic compound, basically it will combine either two pictographs or two ideographs. For example, uh, here you have this word, which means bright, right? And on the left side, you see the character for the sun, ri, and on the right side, you see the character for yue, the moon. And the character together, putting them together, um, 
Ming is formed, and Ming means right. And this example, Cai, um, the upper part is uh, the claw or the hand, and the uh, lower part is the tree or wood. And so this gives you idea that you are gathering or collect something uh, from the woods. So these are ideograph compound. And the fourth type, phonetic compound, Qing Sheng Zi. So you can see all these char three characters, they share one common component on the right side. And the pronunciation of the, this component is Huang. So it gives a clue as to how these three characters will be um, the pronunciation of these three characters. So they all sounded the same, Huang, Huang, Huang. However, um, on the left side of each character, they have different radicals. So the first character has this radical for jade. So this first character actually means a special type of jade. And the, for the second character, it has this radical, shi or stone. So this character means sulfur. And then the last character here, it has the sandian shui, the water component. Um, and this character means pool of water. So these are the phonetic compound. So phonetic compound usually has a semantic component, and there's also a phonetic component. And the phonetic component will give you a clue as to the general um, pronunciation of this character. So here comes up uh, our second poll for today. Um, so I would like to ask the audience to um, complete a second poll. Um, I don't know if I can launch it or not this time. Can people see? Oh, okay, I'm launching it now. So based on your knowledge about Chinese characters, um, what do you think the majority of Chinese uh, characters are? So do they belong uh, to the you know, pictograph category or ideograph or ideographic compound or phonetic compound? Okay. Give you a few more seconds. Okay, so about two thirds of audience members have completed this, and I will end. The, oh, do people need more time? Okay, so I will end poll now, and I can show share the result. So here, some people believe you know most Chinese characters are pictographs, and um, some people think they are ideographic compounds. Most of them should be ideographic compounds, or others think um, phonetic compounds. So here's the thing. I think um, it's interesting. Nobody is saying that you know Chinese characters are ideographs. Good. So the ideographic myth has been kind of debunked. That's good news. Um, but also, I think um, still there are some people who might think most of the Chinese characters are pictographs. But actually, that's not the case. Um, the correct answer should be actually um, should be D, phonetic compound. Um, so the so-called ideographic myth or pictographic myth about Chinese characters are so widely spread uh, in, in the Western world um, that many people are misled um, by, by this account about uh, Chinese characters. Um, so let me okay, stop sharing here. Um, so if we compare um, Wang Yun's book, uh, the primer, the characters uh, in his primer, with some of his two contemporaries um, who also wrote books about Chinese characters, there's some interesting finding. <clears throat> so for Zheng Qiao, that's another philologist of the 18th century, uh, he analyzed altogether 24,235 characters and of these um, characters, about 90% are phonetic compounds. And another scholar, uh, Zhu Jingsheng, he analyzed altogether 9,475 characters, and he found that 81% were actually phonetic compounds. And if you compare this with uh, Wang Yun's selection in his primer, in his primer, only about 20% or phonetic, phonetic compound. So why did he do that? 
the minimal attention that he gives to Xing Sheng characters is really striking. So, and also if we further examine the subcategories of uh, Wang Ying's characters that he presented in the primer, there's also some interesting finding. <clears throat> of the four major types of characters, he put emphasis on ideographic compound. He further delineated 21 subcategories and included altogether 20, uh, 1,254 characters in, the, in, this, in this category. So that's about 60% of his entire inventory of 2,000 characters that he presented to young children. So as an erudite scholar, Wang Ying actually was not unaware of the dominant number of Xingsheng characters in the Chinese writing system. So he actually knew that the majority of Chinese characters belong to the phonetic compound category. But he intentionally gives them the least attention for, um, in his primer. And he, there are three reasons why he did that. First, he believes that xiangxing or pictographs and zhi shi or ideographs, they are the most fundamental of the six character formation principles. He believes that the patterns in nature, for example, natural phenomenon as the sun and the moon, give rise to pictographic characters and that the patterns in the human world, for example, numerals and the directions, they prom prompted the creation of ideographic characters. In other words, the pictographic and the ideographic devices were used at the earliest stages of the development of Chinese writing. Second, he considers hui yi or ideographic compound to be the most to be the most complex category because it combines characters originally formed through pictographic and ideographic principles. According to him, ideographic compound characters can be formed by combining two pictographs, two ideographs, one pictograph plus one ideograph, or two phonetic semantic characters. In some cases, meanings of two parts are added to form a new character, just like you know, ru and yue, sun and moon means bright. In other cases, they are pl placed in contrast with each other. Sometimes meanings is expressed through the position of the component in the char character. Other times a character's shape is changed slightly to give rise to a new character. So Wang Yun believes that all these principles have to be explained clearly to a young child. That's why he came up with 21 subcategories of Hui Yi characters. Third, he believes Xing Sheng phonetic compound characters were formed based on the characters of the three aforementioned categories. In his primer, he includes only those Xing Sheng characters whose shapes have undergone such major changes between the small seal script and the clerical script that their origins have become obscured. In other words, he believes that the Xing Sheng characters or the phonetic compound that he does not include his, in his primer will be self-evident to children after they have mastered the more basic pictographs, ideographs, and ideographic compound characters. Apparently, Wang Ying believed that if children can understand simple or basic characters first, then they can easily learn the phonetic compound characters later. So Tang Biao and Wang Ying's character recognition methods became very popular in the 19th century. By then, a consensus has been reached by teachers and scholars that a stage of character recognition, or shi zi, had to precede the stage of learning to read. Many character books came out to offer young children intensive training in recognizing key characters that often appear in the classics before they even learned these classics. Here you can see one example. In this character workbook, they try to show the small seal style of each character and offer some explanations underneath each character, just in the fashion of Wang Yun's primer. Here's another example of a character workbook. This workbook contains all the characters that are used in the 13 classics, basically the must read for all learners in Imperial China. This workbook contains altogether 545 pages, each page having 12 different characters. 
So altogether, there are 6,540 different characters. A student is supposed to copy and imitate four pages or 40, uh, 48 different characters a day, write for 10 days, and then change. In one year, a student will be able to cover 120 pages or 14, 1,440 characters. So this means that it would take about five or six years to learn all the 6,500 characters in this workbook for all the classics. Wang Yi's work greatly influenced Zhang Zhigong, who was the chief architect of the Chinese elementary education in contemporary China. Zhang Zhigong strongly advocated for a phase for young children to intensively learn characters during the first few years in elementary school. So in today's elementary schools in China, these, the, the children, as soon as they start their journey of learning to read, they will start with pictographs and ideographs. And also during the first uh, three years of their elementary school education, a large number, around, usually around 2,000 characters, are presented to them. Unfortunately, when this method works well for, for children, it doesn't actually work well for foreigners. However, when a lot of foreigners are taught, many teachers use the same method because they were taught in the, like, their first memory about learning to read in Chinese is to sit in, um, in the classroom and then the teacher will tell these interesting stories about these characters and ask them to copy and then they will in learn or copy intensively these characters. So I'm watching a lot of teachers, Chinese language teachers, because they undergo this kind of educational system. So they believe when they teach foreigners, they should use the same method. Um, so in still in a lot of um, schools in America and also in Europe, maybe, um, they, a lot of some teachers will say, oh, Chinese characters are so important. We cannot waste any time to introduce them. So let's do it from day one. Um, unfortunately, this method is actually not right for foreigners. So I wanted to kind of put this out there. So Liang Qichao, a great thinker of modern China, he was also influenced by Tang Biao and Wang Ying's methodology. He recognized the importance of setting a separate phase for character recognition. However, he also devised something new. In Chinese history, Liang Qichao is often known as a journalist, philosopher, and reformist. But in fact, he was also a pioneer in the field of teaching Chinese as a foreign language. When he lived in Macau, he had many Portuguese students. He used the sections on pictographs and ideographs in Wang Ying's primer to first teach these foreign students some basic characters. However, he also realized the importance of the phonetic compounds. He suggests that, that the instruction on phonetic compound characters should be supplemented to Wang Ying's book. He told his students that Chinese writing system consists of 80 to 90% phonetic compounds. He came up with an easy method to teach those characters. He made a table of about 2,000 phonetic compound characters with the columns containing a set of phonetic com components and the rows containing a set of semantic radicals. He hung this table on the class wall and it took his students only a little over 10 days to recognize all the characters listed in the table. So that's really amazing, 2,000 characters in 10 days. Um, I don't know whether this is true or not because we no longer have this table. Um, I wish we could you know, actually find this table and see how um, Liang Qichao devised his system. Um, but the idea here is important. Liang Qichao recognized the important role that sound play in the process of learning to read in Chinese. And this is especially important for foreign learners. He didn't promote the idea that characters were pictures or ideographs to his foreign students. So here is the irony. Tang Biao and Wang Ying's method was innovative in their own times, and it helped children to learn to read from a much younger age. But when native speakers placed too much emphasis on character recognition for young children, they lost sight of the fact that the sound of a word and connecting the sound with the meaning of a word is critically, critically important in literacy training. 
This is especially important for foreign learners of the Chinese language. A lot of Chinese language teachers tend to put too much emphasis on character recognition at the initial stage when a student starts to learn the language without paying enough attention to the sound or the spoken language. So the audio, the oral, oral aspect of literacy training is really critical. This is actually you know, the wisdom from um, Chinese cultural history. All these teachers, they realize the importance of it. The visual and graphic aspect of characters should always come after a student can already connect the sound with the meaning of a word. For many native Mandarin speakers, they already have a lot of audio input to do this. Therefore, the intensive training in character recognition would work for them. However, for second language learners who do not have the language environment or enough language in linguistic input, the best way is always to learn the spoken language first and then start literacy training. This will be less time consuming and more effective. So if you are teaching a two or three year old, who has just begun the journey of, of learning to read in your own language. So again, it doesn't have to be Chinese. It can be any language. You just need to do one small thing. Point to the word when you read aloud to them. This way, the child will soon be able to match the sound with the meaning and the shape of a word. So this is a very simple reading technique, and it would actually do the trick. So believe me, try it if you have a young child. Um, at home who is learning, starting to learn to read. So to um, conclude my talk, last but not least, in these difficult times when we experience a pandemic and also witness too many wars on this planet, it has never be so, been so clear that we human beings need to learn to collaborate and coexist by listening to each other and talking to each other so that we could build trust and find common ground. I started out this talk by saying that the Mohican language had been extinct for several decades. Just in the past decade, the Mohicans have tried to revive their language. Now there are children who are being raised having Mohican as their first language. Let's help them preserve their language and culture. Let's celebrate indigenous languages and celebrate our own mother tongue if we have one. There's already too much distraction news these days. Just a few days ago, I heard of yet another piece of bad news. A small liberal arts college in Pennsylvania is terminating their Chinese language program without any advance notice. And apparently enrollment was not a deciding factor. When questioned about this decision, the provost and dean of the college responded, quote, you can do Chinese studies without taking the language. It is one of the options in the Chinese studies minor. I recommend maintaining Chinese studies or more broadly an Asian studies minor." End of quote. The fact that these words come out of the mouth of the provost and dean of a liberal arts college, himself a product of liberal arts education, is unbelievable and alarming. You can do Chinese studies without taking the language. By the same token, you will be able to do French studies without ever learning French. You can do Russian studies without having to learn Russian, so on and so forth. With this logic, perhaps we shouldn't learn English at all. We have to realize that learning a language is not just to obtain a tool for communication or to access the knowledge produced by a different culture or civilization, we had to go beyond this utilitarian mode of thinking and recognize that there are important humanistic reasons to learn an additional language. With the right method, adults can learn another language successfully, very quickly, and children can become bilingual or multilingual also relatively easily. So I will stop here. Um, with a plea, if you have the time, please learn an additional language. Consider doing that. So I'll end my talk here, and uh, we can go into the Q and A um, section. Stop sharing. Okay. I will go to Q 
Q&A. I will see if there are any questions. Great. So here is a question uh, from an audience member. In 1997, I watched English being widely taught to children in schools in Chongqing. In 2005, I learned that Chinese teachers taught English to children using computer programs. Is teaching English to ch Chinese children a national effort today? Um, so I think there are several questions in there. Um, I would say that English is widely taught in China. Um, so kind of to share some anecdotes. So my parents' generation, English was not a like a go-to foreign language for uh, people to study. So I think in contemporary China, there's always this urge for people to learn a foreign language. So before the 1970s, it was Russian. Russian was the most popular language. Everybody, you know, in school, Russian would be taught, um, and people will um, try to kind of translate a lot of uh, Russian books uh, from Russian into Chinese. So Russian was kind of the dominant language. I would say the language of power during that time for Chinese people for China. Um, but then um, after 1978, when China opened up. Um, so Deng Xiaoping, he launched this uh, reform and open door policy, basically is to open the door to Americans, because Deng Xiaoping uh, had said, you know, whoever worked with uh, Americans before their country will prosper. Um, so let's do that, right? So there's open and reform policy. And then many uh, students realize English is important. So uh, English also became the main subject. So when I was in elementary school, uh, in starting from third grade, so my school was kind of unique. We started to learn English when we were in the third grade, um, but mostly uh, for other schools, is uh, when the, when students are in the fifth grade or sixth grade, English is introduced as a, one of the main uh, three main subjects. So I don't, I, I would say it's considered as a very important subject area. Um, I wouldn't say there's kind of national effort, but definitely there's a lot of um, national interest, a popular interest in English. However, just recently, I think last year, um, I've heard some news from China that um, people were talking that the central government was thinking about removing English as one of the three um, foundational courses in elementary education. So usually Chinese language, art, math, and English would be considered as the three main subject areas. Uh, but there are, there are talks now to remove English from this. We don't know whether this is a political decision or not, um, because I, I think people react to it in a political way, because right now there's a trade war uh, between China and America, and then everything, the pandemic. Um, so some people think maybe the, the hawks in the Chinese government, they are trying to be more friendly to, to Russia and less friendly to America and thus they kind of remove English. But I think the com the reasons are more complex than that. Um, because another reason is that just in the past two or three decades, students, school children's um, uh, pressure in school has just become so enormous that it's really unbe uh, unbearable. Children are, you know, like I said, in traditional China, people study for the civil service examination. In contemporary China, they study for the Gaokao. Um, the college entrance examination. Um, and uh, so the Chen Central government tried to kind of remove some of the pressure from students. So they are trying to lessen the workload. So there's another narrative going on saying that this is really part of the effort to lessen the workload for children. And that's why English is being removed as a main subject. So I don't really know. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question. So second question, what do you think of language acquisition from sources such as weekend Chinese schools for Chinese American diaspora? That's a great question. Um, actually, I have been, I think starting about two years ago, I have been working with some uh, weekend Chinese schools. Um, I talked to their principals about how to innovate their language pedagogy uh, because a lot of the language uh, Chinese schools weekend Chinese schools, they are also struggling now. They're losing students, they're losing enrollments because students hate to be there. Um, why? Because just like I said in my talk, 
a lot of the Chinese teachers, uh, they, they, they were raised in China and they thought the way they were taught Chinese should be the same as they teach like non-Chinese um, students, right? Um, so they're using the wrong method. So Chinese weekend schools are really, they kind of give a lot of pressure on the students. Maybe they put too much emphasis on character um, uh, copying or uh, reading and without really focusing on the spoken language and the usage of a real language. So a lot of children, they were forced by their parents, Chinese American children, they were forced by their parents to go to these weekend school in the first place. And they lost the time to uh, play with their friends, right? And then they encounter this kind of boring um, pedagogy. So apparently they hate, they hate being there. So that's why in our college, uh, we see students coming from these weekend Chinese schools and they come in with various proficiency levels. Um, so that's a very interesting uh, phenomenon. But I think this happens like with a lot of uh, heritage learners, I would say. Okay, so here is another question. Um, yeah, I was part of William's first program in Chinese, a 1972 winter studies course taught by a Chinese professor of chemistry. Oh yeah, Raymond Chang, Professor Zhang. Yeah, Professor Zhang was actually the first. Oh, interestingly, our focus included pen and ink calligraphy, which exposed the beauty of the characters. I found that valuable in learning to appreciate the language. That's a very good point. I totally agree with you. Um, so calligraphy is really, uh, I would say like a cultural achievement um, of Chinese culture. And I think it represents a height of Chinese civilization. Um, and I definitely think that Chinese characters have their in, in, in internal beauty to it, right? And also it's a good motivator for a lot of um, uh, foreigners or uh, language learners. Um, and so here there's really, you have to kind of make the distinction. Are you trying to learn Chinese calligraphy or are you trying to learn the language to be able to function in the language? Or do you just want to be exposed to the culture as an enrichment? So Professor Raymond Chang, um, I heard from my colleagues, senior colleagues here is that, yeah, he was the first professor who offered Chinese language courses here, but because it's winter study, you can't really train people intensively, right? And also he's a, he was a chemist, not a language pedagogue. So I think he uses kind of a enrichment approach. So he would introduce um, calligraphy. And also I think he, I heard that his wife is a librarian who actually writes children's books. So they collaborate on some interesting books. So I think using this kind of culture um, to lure students into learning language, that's a good approach. Um, and also um, Professor um, Scarlett Zhang, who just retired uh, from the art department a few years ago, she also offered a Chinese calligraphy course. And I wish all my students could take the course. Uh, it's really good. Um, yeah, so, so, I, so I agree with that comment. Um, and bravo. <laughs> okay, do you think international events like the two, two, uh, 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics encourage viewers to want to learn more about China and even learn Chinese language? Or do these global events rather give the impression that English is enough to understand China? So frustrating. Wow, that, that's a really great question. Um, I would say probably it's not 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics because right now, I really don't know how many people are watching this game. I'm not watching it. Um, I think if we say something really attracted attention, uh, attracted global attention, I would say it was the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games that really got everybody's attention on China and also on Chinese. Um, I remember just, I think that was the time, I think I had just arrived uh, at Williams, I arrived at Williams at 2005, and then Olympic was 2008. And then during that year, we had 60, 60, 60 students in our Chinese 101, 102 class. Um, I remember my colleague, uh, Professor Neil Kubler, had to teach four sections um, and um, had a coarse voice. 
Um, so I think 2008 really changed China and got a lot of students interested in learning Chinese language and culture. But 2022, I'm not sure. But whenever you have this kind of um, global event, you get the, you know, the eyeballs, right? Um, toward kind of spotlight a certain region, a certain area. Um, so there's definitely this kind of positive thing there. However, I totally agree with your comment that English is, <laughs> in a lot of international um, events, English is enough, right? Um, so it's really sad. Um, and I think people really need to, I think this is also the, another thing I wanted to emphasize. I think here nowadays, people tend to learn a foreign language because it's useful. So I talk to students, you know, they, they, some of them learn Chinese because it's useful. Um, but you never know whether something becomes useful or not. How can you predict? Um, for me, kind of to share my own language learning experiences, I, I learned English uh, when I was very young, but I never really learned how to speak the language, right? We learned grammar, we learned reading, but we didn't really speak. So I, I came to America and I realized, oh, the language, the English that I learned was a dead language, like dead in my sense. So I had to relearn the spoken uh, English. Um, but then I also learned, so when I learned English, I didn't know I would come to America one day, right? And I also learned uh, German. I also taught myself some Japanese. Um, I, even though I'd never reached very high level in those languages, they opened the doors for me. Uh, they changed myself. For example, after I learned Japanese, I stopped hating the Japanese people because if you grew up in China, uh, like I grew up in China in the 1970s and 80s, we, we, we hated Japanese because of the World War II, the, the Japanese invasion. So for no, no reason, I hated Japanese people. But after I learned the language and started to appreciate their culture, the hatred just disappeared. And I made friends with some of the uh, some, some Japanese students that I taught, even though I just spoke, you know, very <laughs> poor Japanese, it was really helpful to connect you with people who are from a different language, right? Um, so I think this is, and also I also learned a little bit German, and also I didn't know it opened an opportunity for me to do, to do research. I got a research fellowship in Germany uh, a few years ago. So you never know. So don't have a utilitarian mode when you start a language. Yeah, so that will be kind of my plea to all the students who, who are in the audience. Okay, so I guess I answered all the questions. Yeah, so thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for your questions. Thank you very much, Li Liu, for a wonderful talk and, and for answering questions for us. Thank you so much. Everyone, please give uh, Li Yu a, a virtual uh, thank you. Thank you, Kasia.